So I'd like to start off really uh, with prides because they're the most contradictory affair but millions and millions of people take part in prides, marches and celebrations all across the world and it's on a scale that we've probably never seen before and this is a sign I think of how far we've come. Overall though they're not the radical reflection of the three solid nights of rioting which gave birth to the modern LGBT movement uh, in uh, June 1969. This followed the police raid of the Stonewall Inn which is a New York gay bar and in, in the aftermath LGBT people, many black, many trans, reclaimed the streets from the police and that's really the real roots of pride. In Silvio Rivera's words, we were let out of the bar and they, the police, kettled us all up in the police vans. The cops pushed us up against the grates and fences. People started throwing pennies, nickels and coppers at the police and then the bottle started. We won't take any, any more of this shit. It was, the, it was the street gay people from the village out front, homeless people who lived in the park outside the bar, and, and drag queens behind them and everyone else behind them. The Stonewall Inn telephone lines were cut and they were left in the dark. And many of the rioters were Latino like Sylvia and black like her friend uh, Marsha P. Thompson. And from the, the, the riots, the Gay Liberation Front formed with its own program and calls for liberation. Sylvia and Marsha also helped form STAR, which was street transvestites action revolutionaries. The rioters that were dismissed as sick or perverted by many took inspiration from the anti-war and the black power movements of the 60s. The Gay Liberation Front was named after the Viet Cong, America's enemy. But if not a riot, you'd certainly expect the prides that we have today to be a protest, as we don't have equality and we certainly don't have liberation. So pride being openly celebrated by millions is reflecting the seismic shifts in social attitudes um, and is all a tribute to the struggles from below and those roots. But pride has also become an abomination. It's been taken over, expropriated, commodified, co-opted and distorted by big business. This year in London, tax dodging, um, union busting Starbucks, who exploit workers globally, were given pride of place on the parade, along with the thieving bankers Barclays, who crashed our economy, paid billions in bonuses and continue their dodgy practices with impunity. And this isn't just a blatant attack on the foundations of what pride represents. It's more insidious. Not only did pride in, in the Pride in London board relegate lesbian and gay support the minors from the front of the parade, um, and despite it being really the 30th anniversary of where the minors reciprocated the solidarity, and he's the root of many of the legal reforms that we see today because it was those unions that took it up in the TUC and the Labour Party. But they also took, um, you know, the, the theme of this year's Pride, uh, Pride Heroes. And it was really, uh, it's, you know, it's a great idea. It's the way for people to nominate their heroes in the LGBT movement. And anyone could do it. Um, and it implied a kind of democracy about it as well. But it was sponsored by Barclays and Starbucks. So Pride Heroes would be... Um, was always designed to be promoted in billboards and buses throughout Pride. But imagine the horror when alongside Mike Jackson, um, one of the original members of Lesbian and Gay Support the Minors, you've got Starbucks saying, Dan is our Pride hero. Mm. And I checked because I thought, well, you know, is Starbucks kind of nominating a gay member of staff and asking everyone to do it, you know, to show Pride in you know a gay worker kind of thing but I can't find Starbucks Dan anywhere it's not on the website it's not an official nominee a uh, nominee I don't even know if Starbucks Dan exists but this sums up everything that's wrong about it because if Starbucks Dan exists he's on minimum wage the bosses don't allow him to join a union he's not just being exploited but he's being physically commodified in a poster to promote a tax dodging corporation and that's really about trying to mask you know cover up their shitty image of all the tax dodging um, but masking the real um, the fundamental inequality that exists in society uh, which is class and I'm sure you've all got similar experiences as prides as well, and I hope you bring them up in the meeting. 
But there's always been two souls of the struggle for LGBT rights, and this was shown well in 1973, as the rise of the respectable gays seeking to appeal to the bosses on the back of other people's struggles sought to exclude Sylvia Rivera from the stage of Pride in New York. And these were the ideas, really, that, you can, that we all have a common interest, um, that we need to be respectable. Um, it's all kind of underlined by defeatism and fatalism, that we can only achieve gradual reform and we can only successfully appeal to the bosses if we don't have the embarrassment of street people, drag queens and prostitutes. And Sylvia rejected that idea. She stormed the stage and took the mic. Just as today, a black migrant trans activist laid into bomber drone killing Obama about detention centres and the lack of Medicare following the equal marriage announcement. As selective reforms have taken place, because it doesn't include all of us, um, this of course has added to the strength of those reformist ideas, um, that, that it's the way forward, it's, it's the way that we um, achieve our equality. Um, and it brings those people that advocate for it more distant from the roots and has allowed them to be co-opted as well. And they're often being used, um, well, if they become bosses, of course, they benefit from the exploitation of people. But of course, we recognize the hypocrisy of that. LGSM, maimed, uh, Lesbian and Gay Support the, mind, uh, the Miners, maintained a really principled stars, stance at London Pride. They refused to separate from the unions and they formed a really militant block at Pride along with the trade unions and students. It was really young, very, very militant and it's filled with anti-cuts anti placards. It linked the attacks with LGBT people with the attacks on all working class people. The chants echoed, no borders, no nations, stop deep Deportations. Our pride is not for sale. Put the bankers into jail. Cameron, 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 out, out, out. Thatcher, 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 dead, dead, dead. <laughs> and this is fantastic. It's fantastic to hear young people who weren't even born when Thatcher was Prime Minister seeing the class relationship there. And of course, Pride kept, took place just a week after the, the massive People's Assembly demonstration of 250,000 people that took to the streets against austerity. So the idea that we have a common interest with the thieving bankers, gay or straight, is clearly ridiculous. The owners of more than half of the world's wealth, equivalent to 3.6 billion people, can fit on a double-decker bus. The insidious idea that class divisions can be hidden or used to pinkwash the image of companies or attack other oppressed people in society is more open to criticism than ever. The activists all over the country all of us, really, are injecting politics into prides. In Birmingham, the weight of socialists rooted in the trade unions, community organisations and student groups were able to organise um, for lesbian and gay support the minors and the unions to lead the Birmingham parade. We were then able to organise a free event with a film showing uh, lesbian and gay support the minors talking at it and a socialist choir uh, for ne nearly 200 people. In Chesterfield, I was having a chat with comrades there, and they're talking about organising a march because the official pride there won't have one. And Cardiff have got plans as well, which is really exciting. So let's have a talk about that in the discussion as well. In another town, people who are sickened by Nando's exploiting the parades formed an online petition to shame them into paying towards the community event. Pride belongs to us, and it's important we don't concede this ground. Um, but unlike Barclays and Starbucks, the situation for reforms is altogether more complicated because they can present the illusion that they will bring the liberation that we need, um, not just reforms in our equality. And there's a massive contradiction between our formal equality in law and our lived experience. And the most potent examples of the reforms, really, that have taken place. Um, in 2013, the UK and France passed equal marriage into law. In May, Ireland passed equal marriage by referendum, celebrated by thousands of people on the streets and reinvigorating LGBT campaigns across Ireland throughout the referendum period. And when equal marriage was passed in the US, 26 million Facebook users has changed their profile pictures to rainbows. And so it's not lost on people all across the world. And I think, you know, broadly, um, this, is, this is a massive, massive shift. And it follows a decade of legal reform. Trans, 
Transgender people's rights also took a massive step forward with the Gender Recognition Act in 2004 and the UK's Equality Act of 2010 insists on parity of protection between all protected characteristics, including gender identity and sexual orientation. And today, people are much more visible in society. There's a greater uh, acceptance and commitment to LGBT rights. Um, a recent poll found that 90% of people backed laws barring discrimination les uh, against lesbian and gays, and 73% thought that discrimination called for corrective action. More people, including sports icons, are, are feeling able to come out. Um, and perhaps 10 years ago, it would have been inconceivable that Conchita would win the Eurovision Song Contest, or Frank Maloney, a former boxing promoter, could announce her gender transition to Kelly in 2014 to a generally sympathetic response. But of course, these are few and far between still. And that the reality is more contradictory. While that these in they, these are very, very important advances in civil and workplace rights, and they continue to be won. There remains a high level of homophobia, transphobia, biphobia, institutionalised discrimination, hate crimes, harassment and abuse. And it remains a cornerstone of fascists in the UK. The French National Front, where Clement Merrick, a young anti-fascist, was killed. And also in Russia and Eastern Europe, where fascist organisations attack prides and other events and even have humiliated, tortured and abused LGBT people on YouTube after hunting them down. In the UK, we've seen serious homophobic attacks too. Not long ago, uh, Ian Bainham was murdered in central London, James Parks in Liverpool, um, leaving a, a nightclub and was left with multiple skull fractures. And horrifically, in 2011, um, Stuart Walker was beaten, tied to a lamppost and burnt to death in Scotland. And figures do show a rise in, in, in homophobic attacks taking place. But the, there's also a huge swathe of attacks that are taking place in terms of cuts. In education, massive cuts to colleges and universities hit LGBT students harder. NUS figures say that one in seven LGBT students and one in three trans students fear losing financial support. Uh, if they come out to their parents. And you look at the latest budget where they're taking away uh, the maintenance there as well. Gove escalated New Labour's privatisation of schools and Toby Tory Young, one of their MPs um, and, and a leading free school advocate, said the idea about LGBT History Month uh, that 12-year-olds should be dragooned into creating banners and other materials promoting LGBT week is preposterous. And the government's free school agreement, which is like a model agreement that they put into academies and free schools, says that um, schools should ensure that children are at the academy are protected from inappropriate training materials and that they learn the nature of marriage and its importance for family life and bringing up children. Now that is section 28. And guess what? It's under section 28 in their model free schools agreement. So that is being introduced as we speak. Um, whether the schools adopt them or not is a different matter. Um, but nonetheless, teachers have always fought these things, and students too, and there are brilliant initiatives like Schools Out, it's been around for um, a few decades now, Educate and Celebrate, and initiatives like Challenging Homophobia in Primary Schools uh, that we have in Birmingham. Um, with housing, there's a massive housing crisis, isn't there? One in 12 people's on a waiting list for social housing, um, but LGBT people face discrimination. Housing charity Crisis uh, report that in urban areas, 30% of young homeless people are LGBT. Um, one in four transgender people have moved because of has harassment, and Osborne has reduced, uh, introduced restrictions on housing benefits to those under 21, basically saying you, you are forced to have dependence on your parents or you face destitution. In health, a Stonewall survey in April found gay and bi men are seven times more likely to attempt suicide than other men. One in 16 young gay or bi men had tried to take their life in the last year, and cuts to the NHS and LGBT community groups will worsen this. Many trans people are having sex reassignment surgeries cancelled, and these are virtually impossible to get anyway. People with HIV on benefits are being forced back into work, and ring fencing for LGBT sexual health has been removed. But campaigns to save the NHS 
can provide a basis for all of us to unite and fight back against uh, these attacks. With immigration, the government scapegoats migrants, LGBT asylum seekers amongst the most vulnerable facing torture and rape in countries they fled. And Stowe will say, in many cases, they're sent back to countries where they fear uh, uh, persecution constantly. And now the government wants to bring in an immigration bill that assumes deportation for all migrants, not just those who've supposedly committed a crime. But again, our anti-fascist campaign, UN Anti-Racism Day, and all the militant resistance to the po politics of hate and division raise the prospect of LGBT migrants and asylum seekers leading this resistance alongside us. Um, in terms of our rights at work, uh, LGBT people are twice as likely to need to work after 70. Uh, the government is dismantling much of the protection laws, stopping LGBT people being sacked, and access to tribunals for unfair dismissals are being limited. Um, unemployment amongst trans people is three times higher. So how do we understand this situation? Because there's massive, massive strides in our formal equality and legislation, and even the Tories claim that they've got um, more out gay MPs than any other parties. Even Barclays Bank, you know, I mean, there's a big shift here, isn't there? They suddenly think it's profitable to be on Pride. They'd have never done that before. Um, and this is all, you know, tribute to our campaigns and our struggles. But there's... Um, and, and, and you've got mainstream liberals and LGBT campaigns that claim that we've reached our destination, um, shifting their campaigns elsewhere and globally. Um, and we're, you know, we seem to be included in all parts of society. But the contradiction, of course, is there's the hate attacks, the devastating everyday experiences of LGBT people, which says otherwise. And I think part of that is, you know, like women's oppression, racism, and discrimination of disabled people, LGBT oppression is systematically and institutionally rooted in our society, and therefore every aspect of our lives. And people probably know about the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, um, where it coined the phrase institutionalized racism. The pitiful 1% conviction rate reported uh, for reported homophobic hate crime suggests really clearly that similar institutionalized discrimination takes place in our justice system. And that pattern is replicated through all of the institutions, I think, and no more so than the nuclear family. The Tories know that cutting public services mean promoting traditional family values. And despite most people not living in an, an idealised nuclear family, the bosses know that it's the cheapest, most efficient means of raising another generation of workers to exploit. And in Cameron's own words, he says the best form of welfare state is the family. So why pay for childcare, elderly care and housing and all of these things if idealised families will pick up and carry the burden? An equal marriage doesn't mitigate against this oppressive, privatised institution. Currently, 91% of the cost of raising children is met by working families, so imagine what further cuts will do. And LGBT people get cut out for not fitting this mould or, or treated as threats to its efficiency. And these values are reinforced economically and politically in, in all parts of our lives. So LGBT people, single parents and other non-conforming people are ostracised. And public services uh, cuts force conformity to that mould or destitution. And the institutionalised, uh, so the institution of the family also privatises and atomises our life. It makes it easier for the government to shift uh, economic and political battles into moral ones. Uh, blaming parents for delinquent children, for not providing for their families, or so that an LGBT person blames themselves uh, for not fitting in rather than the system. And this government is systematically increasing the exploitation of every worker to pay for their crisis, but also adding to the oppression of LGBT people, disabled people, black people, as really as a calculated bid to divide our resistance and help them drive through that austerity. And homophobic bullying in schools is a really poignant example of this. The term gay is a common term of abuse up to one in five LGB and one in three transgender students have felt it would be easier to kill themselves than to come out. And this contributes to a situation where many of the attacks and the murders that have taken place are actually from young people. 
Um, so, you know, I'm so sure we're going to see this with this government attacking young people more and more and more, blaming them, um, you know, the next generation of people, they're full of hate or whatever. Um, but the responsibility of this lies with the Tories for introducing Section 28, um, which for years prevented discussion of homosexuality in schools unless it was in connection with death or disease. And, you know, unless... And it's, and it's created massive da damage to a generation of people and now is being reintroduced, again, like I said, through the Model Free School Agreement. But when schools openly condemn homophobic bullying, LGBT students are 60% less likely to be bullied, yet only a quarter of schools do, do so. So, and, the, and the fact that they do is because we fought for it. It's students and, and teachers that have fought for that. So homophobia um, amongst the young reflects an institutionalised failure. But look at the, um, I mean, I hope people will talk about pride as well and the experiences of the Pontefract students, because it really blows, you know, they created a magnificent environment for all of, all of their, um, for all of their, uh, in their school of environments that made people feel comfortable um, and stand up and stand out. But fundamentally, the gap between formal equality and our lived experiences is a class divide. So we see how LGBT oppression is institutionalised in society. And I think this is summed up, really, by, you know, gay Tory MP Alan Duncan, is not my brother. Lesbian, <laughs> lesbian Tory MP Margot James, is not my sister. And David Cameron, is not my friend. Duncan is a multi-millionaire uh, former former oil trader. He claimed more than 4,000 in expenses for gardening. Margo, Margo James sold her £4 million PR firm so she could become an MP in Staffordshire. And it's really hard to see, isn't it, how any of those people could have difficulties with their health care or needing to, to work beyond their retirement age. So that's the other side of the class divide, really. The Tory government continues to be a disaster um, for millions of ordinary people, and that, of course, includes LGBT people. And it's the Tory banker friends who help create the economic crisis, but they aren't suffering. The chief executive of HSBC being paid seven and a half million, he ain't suffering. Um, Bob Diamond pocketed 17 million, and the bosses of the top 100 companies are paid an average of over three million a year. And of course, there's 120 billion pounds in taxes that are evaded and voided by the rich. And rather than take the money off the rich, the government is cutting the services that ordinary people use. And that means that those already facing discrimination, um, like LGBT people, disabled people, women, black people, we're going to suffer the most. Uh, our exploitation is compounded by that oppression. From younger to older, the drive to, re to increase profitability by the Tories and the bosses is really, really clear. And young people are forced onto work fair and worked for free. Older people, their pensions are slashed. Fuel po poverty is, is leading to people's deaths and the closure of elderly people's homes and, and services. And the Tories have the nerve to say they're the champions of LGBT equality. How dare they? Cameron has walked uh, about withdrawing aid from other countries with homophobic supposedly homophobic governments well they are homophobic governments but it's just in his, you know but this is a government that spent billions on war in Afghanistan and Iraq killing millions and millions of people they've just done a deal um, for two billion to sell jets to that champion of human rights Saudi Arabia where gay sex is punishable by death these are Tory hypocrites who aren't going to liberate anybody and working people are being squeezed and attacked at all ends of the spectrum, old and young, gay and straight, women and men, black and white, disabled or not, in every occupation or none. And I think this is a general class attack on us, and it needs a general class response. And we should never affect, uh, um, forget that alongside these attacks, it not only um, raises the hypocrisy of the system, but the prospect of class struggle, which could bring an end to all of our exploitation, but our shared resistance in doing so forces a challenge uh, to divisive ideas and makes uh, class struggle to be the, the tribune of the oppressed. And of course, this isn't inevitable, and revolutionary socialists have always been at the heart of these initiatives. I don't know whether people went to the meeting last night on, on Pride, 
but I think it was really clear in, in the film um, and in Nicola's talk about really how transformative struggle is to our ideas. And it's this tradition of solidarity and shared resistance which is not only vital in bringing a much wider fight back, but ensures that we can't be divided from one another. We can't be counterposed by the Tories or the EDL or other groups that seek to do so. And we have to be the champions of the oppressed for within our struggle, placing all of our issues right in the heart of resistance. So in all of those hospital campaigns, the campaigns for education, we need to make sure that all of these issues are right in the middle of them um, and taken up in every single battle, opposing every single cut. And we need to argue for an alternative to austerity, but one that also can dismantle the institutions that exploit and oppress us in the process. And that's why Marxists, we fight for an analysis based on class, looking to where the power lies to overcome divisions, but also to smash capitalism. And we, we don't agree with people who say that class is just another form of oppression. Um, alongside LGBT, uh, women, and, and all of the other oppressed sections of society, uh, we need to look about what's unique about the working class, um, which is that we, that we can smash capitalism and we can have a society um, where, where we run it for ourselves. So when we fight for all of these things to defend our rights, we need to, to also be looking towards a future free from persecution, towards a future free from exploitation and oppression, and that means we need to unite with others to build a movement rooted in the working class that's able to respond effectively to the cuts, racism, and all the other forms of division but also to recognise that we're part of a much bigger attack on the working class, the greatest since the Depression, and therefore we need to be part of a much bigger fight, not just for equality, but for liberation, the creation of a world uh, where people don't see the need to categorise sexuality or gender, but we feel free to be who we are, love who we want, without fear, and where we can see the liberation of all humanity. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to expand on the Gender Rec Recognition Act that was mentioned. Um, I'm a transgender man, and that's the first time I've said that to this many people. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I um, started transitioning in 2011, and I was... Uh, under 18 at the time and it made it very difficult for me and um, in the end I was forced to pay for medically necessary hormones due to some complications and surgery privately which was very very difficult for someone in my family's financial position um, and then eventually it came to the Gender Recognition Act which you know um, is presented this as you know um, perfect equality for us um, we can uh, we can transition legally uh, for those who don't know, it enables us to get uh, um, a birth certificate um, with the gender that we are, rather than what we are assigned at birth, and, uh, for, and that gives us certain minor legal protection, protections. Um, it also prevents people from, uh, well, if someone transitions then once, uh, while they're married, they actually have to get divorced. And even the introduction of uh, gay marriage doesn't help this for some reason, as far as I know. You still have to get divorced and then get married again. Uh, I think it also enables the partners to have some control over, uh, uh, control over their partner's uh, transition, which is abhorrent, really. Um, also, I applied for a gender recognition certificate, uh, which failed. Um, you are presented to a panel of judges, which... Uh, um, basically arbitrarily decide whether they think you're worthy of this supposed right to, of this privilege as they put it, to transition uh, I was rejected on financial grounds um, uh, you, you have to pay for the application and despite the fact that I submitted relevant documents showing that I was worthy of a, a fee reduction. They um, didn't think this was correct, and 
uh, didn't let me go ahead, and then certain other problems led to my withdrawing of the application in the end. Um, perhaps this is right. I don't really think that I want to fit in with society's uh, gender binary. I'm just going to leave it at that. Hi, I'm Marianne Owens. I'm from Cardiff. Um, I'm in the um, PCS union. Um, I'm also a member of the SWP. I wanted to talk a little bit about Cardiff Pride and some of the things that, that, that Jeff was talking about. Uh, this year is the 30th anniversary of Cardiff Pride. Now, I have a sneaking suspicion that that's got something to do with the minor strike and the trade unions. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think there might be a bit of a link there. But unfortunately this year, the trade unions have been priced out of taking part in Pride in Cardiff. They wanted Wales TUC to pay £3,000 for, for a stall inside the event, which is inside the Millennium, we've been inside the Millennium Stadium the last couple of years, so it's hidden away so nobody can see it. Presumably that's what Barclays and Starbucks and, and whoever else pay. Uh, they also want us to pay £200 per banner that's on the demonstration. They also want everybody to pay a pound to actually take part in the demonstration. So we're not having this, we've decided. Um, for the last, the last um, two years, we, we've had something in Cardiff, like an alternative free event, because we've always had to pay to get in. And it's, it prices out lots of people, not just um, LGBT people, but it prices out families that might want to come along because of the entertainment and whatever else sits there. And I think that's, a, that's one of the important things about Prides, is that it's part of the wider community as well. Um, but, but so it's, you know, hiding it away is not a good thing behind a fence. So what we've had the last couple of years is something called the Big Queer Picnic, um, which has been a free event outside, which has had all kinds of things. And I want to say a little bit about where that came from, because we had a big abortion rights um, um, campaign in Cardiff. And a lot of LGBT activists recognised in Cardiff that the same people from Spook and 40 Days for Life that were stood outside an abortion clinic preventing women from getting in were the same people that were campaigning against gay marriage. So they came along and supported us. And out of that, out of that demonstration, those people got together and said, well, actually, we're going to have an alternative event in Cardiff. So we've had a link up there between the women's movement and the LGBT movement for quite a while and the trade union movement. So we've had this big queer picnic. And what we're hoping to do this year, which I think is going to be quite important, is get as many trade union bands. We're just going to shove them in. We're not going to pay. We're just going to shove them in beyond the Wales TUC banner. <laughs> Hopefully, we're going to have the LGSM banner there as well. And I'd like to see them in South Wales stop the LGSM banner being at the front of the march, to be perfectly honest. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And then we're going to try and get the trade unions involved with the people from the Big Queer Picnic. I mean, last year, you know, we had an asylum seeker, lesbian woman, help, you know, doing belly dancing workshops. We had, we had political workshops. We had all kinds of things. It broke down so many banners, barriers. We had a picnic. People shared food. That's what we want to do this year, and we'll be doing it outside the gates of where they are so that when people are walking past, they can see, you know, we are not going to be quiet. You know, Stonewall was a riot, and we're not being, being forced to pay. Hi, I'm Pat. I'm a member of SWP in Coventry. Um, I actually wanted to come back to what the first speaker was saying about the gender recognition after a little bit, because I actually can't apply as a non-binary person. So I can't have a gender recognition certificate or a passport, and I might be told to go home once I go to the clinic, once I finally have my first um, show of this. But to be honest, one, one of the things I've noticed about this is because since uh, coming out and finding out more about the trans community, is even though um, a lot of uh, the problems we have are sort of uh, medical based and you can see it very, very much with the more that uh, services are cut, the more likely you're gonna get someone who isn't gonna wanna deal with you. But um, it's very difficult to try and um, encourage younger people then within the trans community to get involved with these things, even though there is a direct correlation. And I think part of the worry of that is because they've had maybe problems when going to see a GP or at the clinic or whatever, they feel that they're, 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 then they wouldn't be accepted, which is why I think it would mean so much to hear it from the unions, especially from um, the unions within the health service, to say that we want the, these people to come and be part of the, the, the fight back. Because I don't know anyone, especially in the LGBT community, who isn't affected by this. You know, there's about four clinics in all the UK for... Um, for transitioning, you gotta pay to get there. Um, I know a lot of people are estranged. A lot of us are on like zero hour contracts. Um, you, and as well, you know, you know these these things take years. It's it's 
um, appointment after appointment after appointment being told, well, you're not fitting this box, you're not fitting that box, you're not fitting the other box. And that's if you are entirely able and healthy. So I know a lot of disabled people, if they're transitioning, drop out because they're just told, especially if they have learning difficulties or something similar, that you can't know your own mind. So what are you doing here? And it's, so it's, it's, it's one of them, like I think a, a very good way of fighting this long term, and especially when it comes to uh, widening the anti cuts movement, is if we hear more from unions that they want to include people, um, especially within the LGBT community, then that is how I think we're gonna be able to get more young people radicalized within it. I just want to come back to the person from Cardiff. It's actually happening in Glasgow. It's now costing people about eight to 12 pounds just to get into this year's Pride which is a two-day event now because it used to be just the one with the big parade and then to Glasgow Green. But that's a disgrace because it's also the same thing. There's another group being set in Glasgow called Alternative Pride because of this. And it's a disgrace that we've got to pay for this now. I'm a straight person, but I'm happy to be at this meeting today to see so many people here because this is a thing that should be free for everyone, whether you're lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, straight, anyway. It should be absolutely open to everyone and everyone should be invited, even the trade unions. And that's all I just wanted to say. Um, Colette Sheffield, SWP. Um, I've heard about uh, quite a few people complaining about what's happening in terms of having Barclays and um, at Starbucks and stuff being involved. Um, and um, in there was also, I think there's a debate going on within the sort of... Um, LGBT community about being more political on the pride marches and things like that. But um, in Sheffield, we had EDL a couple of weeks ago and they decided to come the same day as the pride march. Um, now, what actually happened was the pride event went ahead, but the march was prevented from happening, but the EDL were allowed to march through the city. So we were there in the UAF, uh, the Unite Against Fascism um, section, and we were sort of doing a counter protest. We actually invited Pride to come along and stand with us in that protest and march with us, and they chose not to, um, which we were really disappointed about. So I guess my question is, do, is it true that this is going, is this, are these arguments happening within the community and within the Pride movement? And do you get, sort of get a sense that, they're, um, that they're, they are going to be more political and that they're sort of winning that side of the, the argument or not? Cause here it can feel a bit like it is, but outside of here it might not, so. Uh, Adam Harmsworth, um, SWP member from Coventry as of two days ago. <laughs> um, all I've all I've really got is just a simple question, which is, what's the what's the first or what's the next step to fight back against the against the cuts against against the um, attacks on LGBT people? That's just my simple question, really. Yes, Alec Cage from uh, Leeds. I had the privilege of actually going to uh, Pride in New York, at the 25th anniversary of Stonewall, and I tell you, it wasn't a riot. He charged two dollars for a bottle of water, went to the bar, and there's not even a mention of the Stonewall riots. So we really do have to re-educate re 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 history. But I, I want to come back to the, the, what Jeff was saying about the Pontifact student, and I don't want to repeat the contribution I made last night. So if you heard the contribution I made last night, they raised 18, uh, nearly eighteen hundred pounds. You want to know my why? Come and ask me afterwards. This group is good. There is a thing, isn't there? Because actually what's happened is there's a whole generation that haven't had the defeat that we've had. They saw the film Pride and they said, we want some of that. They haven't seen 30 years of strike after strike after strike losing out. They don't even know what Clause 28 is. And to be honest, they don't even know the words to sing if you're glad to be gay. What's that all about? But this is what's happened, you see, I'll sing it to you later. This is what's happened, is that the, 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 kid, the youngsters that I know basically decided they were going to Pride and they were going to work out a way of getting there. And the first plan was the boys were going to, sorry, young men were going to wear high heels and walk around Pontefract race course for a mile. The principal then tried to ban them on the grounds of health and safety. 
couldn't, couldn't make up. Anyway, to, to, to give them credit, they decided they didn't care whether they were banned or not, so they just changed the name and did it. Anyway, and they marched around Mont Pontefract race, race course shouting, I don't know what I've been told, gender, uh, gender stereotypes got to go. It was fantastic. I was behind the things filming them, but don't tell them that. Um, anyway, they raised the money, etc. Et and one of the things about getting that coach down with Anne Scarl, etc., etc., was it was uh, it was the two generations coming together. And when you, when I heard them singing, um, every woman was a lesbian at heart, including Cameron's wife. I thought, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. You see, when, when the, it wasn't about that. Was the beginning for them. This is a beginning for them. And what they've done now is they're going back into college in, in September with a list of demands. One of the demands is that the, the gender, they, they build gender neutral toilets in the, in, the, in the college. The second demand is that they remove the word your son or daughter to let us home and put your child. The third demand is that you might get cornered to do that, but they're, they're going around looking for speakers on all sorts of LGBT issues and Anne Scargill so they can go to the principal and say, right, we want an equality and diversity day and these are who we've got invited to come. So it's the big, this is what I'm saying, it's the beginning. And I just want to read you the last bit because I know I've got my minute left. When they wrote to the trade union movement, when they wrote to you know, your organisation like United who gave them 500 quid for the coach, etc., the, the, the end of their, their uh, email says, grab a banner. Oh, no, it, it talks about corporate, we won't be silenced by the likes of Starbucks, Microsoft, Dell, etc., etc., etc. Grab a banner and a placard and let your voice be heard. Fight the resistance and mar march in solidarity with your brothers and sisters. Be part of the revolution and join us on the march of, on the 20th. Seventh. Well, that seems a good line to me to sum up on. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Jam Sheffield. So I just want to expand a little bit on uh, the situation that Colette outlined, because uh, last year uh, the, the first Pride March in Sheffield for, I mean, years and years and years, right? and it was a re really lovely day and. Uh, the the reception that they, they got from the, the the march got from the public was great, and we so we we handed out the the beat back the bigots placards, and they went down an absolute storm on that on that march. Now, uh, there were some really unfortunate uh, conclusions were, were were brought out by the Pride because of the EDL coming. Uh, first of all, the whole event last year it was very it was very corporate. But it was also very, very exclusive. I mean, they had these they didn't just have barriers that, uh, around where the event was. They had a bloody wall that you couldn't, you, you could not see over. You know, so it was very much, you know, pack them in, take the money off them, and then keep everybody else out and keep and keep the event actually very much locked down. This year, because of the stuff with the EDL, it actually got booted up to Sheffield University, so it wasn't even in town. And then, unfortunately, the organisers of it took a decision not b just simply because of the EDL, but they also cited the fact that the UAF were uh, going to be around as well for a reason for them not to march. And I learned about this when I was promoting the Unite Against Fascism uh, counter-demonstration at a People's Assembly meeting. And I, Sheffield comrades will be stunned, but I was actually lost for words. I was stood there going... Up, a pink triangle, you know. There's a reason why we've got a pink triangle, for God's sake. Sir. And it was, re you know, that was really horrible. There really is only one solution to this situation, which I'm sure we are absolutely going to carry through in Sheffield. We'll get the LGSM banner and we'll hold our own bloody march. And we will, because people took the argument to Pride in Sheffield, and they, the the uh, the comments that were put up on Facebook about what a disgrace it was to pull the march were just taken down all the time, all the time, and it's real corporate, hand, weighty hand holding it down, but we will shove the politics back into the situation. Uh, most of you have probably heard me last night. Um, my name is Jordan Daly from the Thai campaign. We've been passing a petition round. Uh, I think we've, I don't know if, I think it's maybe sitting there. Um, if you haven't signed it, you can grab it. Uh, basically, if you did hear me last night, apologies for repeating it again, but um, what we are doing in Scotland is we've launched a grassroots campaign called TIE. We are petitioning the Scottish Government directly to make the teaching of LGBT issues and topics uh, statutory in all our schools um, and to get support into the schools. Uh, some of the stories like the person, the first speaker, um, who was talking about their transition and things like that, um, I'm, it, I would probably hasten to bet that a lot of the issues that people have, I know that from my personal experience, would be made a lot better if there was support in somewhere where you spend a lot of your time where you're forced to go to school. Um, so, yeah, that, that's pretty much what the campaign is about. Uh, the way it works in Scotland is we do have these programmes available, but the schools are choosing to opt out, and because most of them are denominational, they're not teaching it. 
Um, my time at school, I'm gay, it was very difficult at school. I was suicidal whilst I was at school um, and there was absolutely no support available. One of the big things for me as well is that I had to self-educate on the LGBT movement, the equality movement. I had to learn myself about Stonewall. I knew all about uh, the civil rights movement, uh, but I didn't know that for every Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, there was a Peter Staley and a Harvey Milk. And that's kind of one of the most important things for me is that if we want to achieve full equality and properly eradicate homophobia, we need to be able to tell our children that actually there's a whole community, there's a whole activism, there's a whole vibrancy here and you need to be learning about it. And we, I think it's a bit, yeah, we probably all agree, I think it's a scandal to not be teaching kids about a movement that is still ongoing just now. Um, there's been a few people talking about kind of um, the, if all the commercialization of pride and kind of all the stuff that's going down. I'm from Glasgow, so I know all about free pride. Um, I know that we're being charged to get into pride. Um, what I just kind of want to emphasize that please don't wait on the LGBT organizations to be doing things for you. We um, This campaign was launched by me and Liam Stevenson, who's sitting over there. This kind of came out of the two of us on the phone talking about my time at school. and. Uh, a couple of weeks later, we've got a grassroots, a grassroots campaign launched, and we've got kind of a lot of national support. <laughs> so, I just I, and that's kind of the one thing that I just want to say. You all know anyway, but please don't wait on the LGBT organisations to be doing it. The situation in Scotland, with us, is we've had no support thus far, thus far from the big groups because they're all government funded, and we are completely rocking the boat with the government just now. So, please, if there is issues or you think that stuff needs to be done, can't network, get people around you like what we've done and go and launch your own campaigns and do it off your own back. And if you'll be able to find us on Facebook as well, it's forward slash Thai campaign. And if anyone's interested in how you can help us out a bit more, because um, we kind of want to hear all your stories when, for when we go in to give evidence to Parliament, uh, we'll be hanging about and you can grab us. Thank you. <laughs> Nicola Field from Southwark SWP. Um, I, sort of carrying on from that, really, I hope that the Thai campaign will um, connect itself with the workers' movement. I think this is what we need to be, uh, the connection we need to be making between the fight against oppression and the industrial struggle, because it's the industrial struggle that has the power to change our society. Um, so, you know, I hope that the, that the Thai campaign and all the campaigns that people start up uh, to, to fight for LGBT equality in, in different uh, sectors and different communities um, make that obvious connection, because uh, you know, we uh, Jeff's superb talk clearly shows that uh, LGBT oppression is part and parcel of class society under capitalism, and that means that our fight back against class society under capitalism has to take a, has to incorporate a fight against sexual oppression and LGBT oppression, and not as a token thing, not as a sideline, not as a few LGBT comrades taking it on in the branches and having to fight with straight comrades to take it seriously, but integrated 100% throughout our campaigning against austerity, and I think that actually in this country we're we're kind of a bit behind when we look at Greece and we look at Spain and we look at Italy and we see those anti-austerity campaigns um, I wonder whether you know we've got we've got to step up to the plate a little bit more in our organization to make sure that those young people um, in the UK who want to fight austerity and who want to fight for liberation understand that the key is to, inv is to uh, connect that fight with the industrial struggle. Um, I mean, I'm part, uh, part of the LGSM original group and, you know, <laughs> what's fantastic about that is that the, uh, the support around LGSM is much, much bigger than the original group. It's overtaken it. It's far more powerful. And I, you know, I, what I really hope is that the LGSM symbol will be uh, a starting point for people to start to make those connections and actually take the LGSM idea and concept and move it straight into the anti-austerity struggle. Because for me, you know, the excitement of Pride in London was totally trailed by the anti-austerity demo the week before. No other LGSM members attended that demonstration um, other than I did. And, and, it, and our banner was carried by teenagers shouting LGBT fight against austerity, LGSM, LGSM fight the Tory scum again. That's the key. <laughs> now, 
you know, that it, it, it's fantastic, but it means something. It means that young people want to fight austerity. They want to fight for sexual liberation. And our branches and our organization has to be the place where they come to. And if it isn't, we are failing. So I think we need to really seriously think how we're organizing our branch meetings. Are they welcoming? Are they exciting? Are they reflecting the energy of young people who want to fight austerity? I, I, Okay, I'll leave you to answer that question yourself about your own branch. Um, I'm not going to say anything about Southwark SWP. Um, but I think, you know, the People's Assembly is obviously a key organising point. We need to be involved in that. We need to be making sure that Can as we're... Organ- yes, I know, Santhi, sorry. Um, we need to be, as, as a trade unionists, we need to be out, proud, and involved in the People's Assembly. Um, so, um, and just one last thing. In Southwark, we have the Haygate Estate. It's been smashed up by Southwark Council that sold off that land for under its market value. 2,000 uh, council homes completely smashed. That was where Mark Ashton lived. It's a part of uh, LGBT history. We need to celebrate that and we need to commemorate that. But more importantly, Defend Council Housing needs to acknowledge that it is also fighting for sexual liberation. Uh, you know, that, that, so that link between okay. our fight against, uh, you know, our fight for decent housing and for LGBT liberation are totally connected. Um, Hi, my name's Clarina Mascarenas. I'm from Watford. Um, I recently saw that on the London March, they let UKIP um, have a place. You know, they blame us for, you know, bad weather. And, you know, <laughs> and then they want to march. <laughs> um, something to say about um, sex education in um, schools. Um, it's very important because they teach children of 16, 17 how to have safe heterosexual sex, and that is very much needed. Um, and also in, for young gay men and women in, um, in schools, When they're having relationships, they need to know how to practice safe sex um, and also how it particularly works because they might not know how to do that. Um, um, And also, I saw on Pink News the other day, someone was obviously writing from from, uh, somewhere that wasn't a liberal sort of thing, um, that it was was horrible that UKIP weren't allowed on the um, Pride March originally. And then there was a subsequent um, article about uh, racism within the community. And I think that's something we also need to combat. Because if you can rule out um, falling in love with someone who isn't particularly white or, um, you know, fits into that sort of UKIP um, or sort of racial profile, then, you know, you're obviously limiting yourself and they need to be taught that racism isn't the way forward because we're just fighting against each other and we need to unite. And that's what Hello everybody, uh, Joseph Cambridge. Um, yes, <clears throat> always after Marxism, the great thing is I go away so full of hope uh, and that really builds me up for the next year. But I hope perhaps I can add to that um, thought of hope, because when I was at school, there was no word gay. Um, If I admit I was at school between 1948 and 1961, the best was homo or bum boy, and there were many that were a hell of a lot worse. Okay, then words like queer and faggot came in, queer long before we regained the word to our own advantage. Gay didn't appear till I was an adult. Um, and the, you saw the film Pride, which is I, I mean, it's just such a wonderful film. I can't remember how many times I've seen it already. My first gay film I saw was Victim. And some of you obviously have seen it. I mean, if you're younger than me, and most of you are, um, I do recommend that you see it because that's what we were presented with. It's all about blackmail. And, of course, you didn't get police support if you were gay and being blackmailed. Then, you know, at last, when I was 24, I could officially have sex without being uh, the threat of going to prison. Um, uh, The August of 67, and I started teaching in the September. 
but I just thought I'd share with you. This will either make you angry, but I hope you'll laugh. This was the discussion in August 67, as the Act was going through. Um, <coughs> this was the Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins. Those who suffer from this disability carry a great weight of shame all their lives. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> I, I am not ashamed, but this is the level of the debate, but at least they got the act through. This is the Lord Aaron who introduced the bill. Uh, I would ask all those homosexuals to show their thanks by behaving themselves quietly and with dignity. Any form of ostentatious behavior, now or in the future, or any form of public flaunting, oh, perish the thought, <laughs> should be utterly um, distasteful, distasteful and make those of us who champion this bill regret that we had ever done it. So be aware of our history. We've come a long way. We've come a long way in my lifetime anyway. The fight isn't over though, is it? Hi, Alexandra Farr from Coventry. Um, Jeff, you mentioned that the homophobic hate crime convi conviction rate was 1%. Is that correct? Well, fuck knows what the trans one is then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as uh, if anyone feel free to correct me, but as far as I'm aware, I am the only trans person that has ever made it through Coventry's court system. I was uh, attacked. I was I had trans slurs thrown at me. I was smashed in the face. Had a cut and a bruised eye. I, they threatened to stab me on several occasions. The police will not help you. You can give them a description all you want. The only way you're going to get these people convicted is if you do your own fucking police work. I had to go and find out where their house was, what the number was, some of the name of some of their fucking mates. And even then, I still had to go and do a lineup. And when I went to do a lineup in this police station, quite out of the way, I might add, when I got to the police station, sat in the room, alerted the officer I was there. I was like, okay, you're doing the lineup. Yeah, right, okay, I'll go and get the people. Who turns up the road? The same two fucking people who attacked me. And then I'm trapped in a room with the same two fucking people who attacked me. And then the police, and then, and then about a few, luckily a few minutes later, the police come out and go, oh, we messed up, oh, blame me, they're in the same room. Okay, and they got me out of there pretty damn sharpish. Uh, and, then, uh, and they were eyeing up my bike as well, but thankfully they didn't attack that. But um, this is the level of the shits the police do not give. <laughs> you know, it's, it, 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 every single bit of police work was down to me. Not them, me. And it, with, with, abuse, with, with abuse and neglect from the police in the process. Now, I did manage to get them to court. I did manage to get them sort of convicted with a 12 month suspended sentence it's already over now and they're not going to get much done much else done the only reason i think that I actually got through was because they were black and we all know the police are as racist as they are homophobic and transphobic and all the rest of it that's probably the only reason that we got through which i really fucking hate um also i'm going to be going into education at some point soon uh, in september um to do a PGCE and yeah I'm kind of terrified about exactly how how out I'm going to be able to be as the, I come under a lot of things under the spectrum of LGBTQIA and I'm essentially reading through the documents seeing what can I say to the children when they ask me questions I ca what can I say without being fired essentially um, so yeah, we do have to get bills such as the, the, the bill that the other comrade was um, trying to get through uh, passed as soon as we possibly can and get that into the schools because if you're a teacher like me it's going to be pretty terrifying in some respects. I'm looking forward to it, don't get me wrong, but it's going to be a big struggle ahead. Okay, um, I, I wanted to start by saying thank you very much for some of the contributions there for really bringing your personal experiences and showing us really what the situation is like for you because I think there's nothing more powerful than that. Um, the comrade from Cambridge talked about how far we've come and I think it's very, very important to, to look at that really because, you know, just in the last few decades you can see an absolutely seismic shift. It is because of us and it's because of us now and it's what's really heartening is all of you are leaders in all sorts of different campaigns um, and activities taking place. Our attitude to pride, what do we do about all of this shitty stuff that they're doing? Do we cheerlead and just go along and say, oh well, we'll just, just go a 
just join in and pay the price do we condemn them there are people that say well it's gone now you know that's the death of pride um i mean there were some fantastic protesters in london they led the front of it with a coffin and stuff you see the thing is they didn't do it separately they went and charged into the front of par the, the parade and they brought the coffin to the front and they were making a point that related to thousands and thousands of people and I think that's got to be our approach that, that we go along and we argue with people and we relate to the thousands and thousands of people that go there that are looking, that have a thirst for political ideas. Um, in terms of the cuts, I think the People's Assembly is, is, is the most immediate thing, isn't it, to try and build that in everywhere we can but really looking at, well, where, where do we have opportunities to break down divisions, link up the class struggle, um, you know, support, show support for strikes and make sure that LGBT issues are right at the forefront of the resistance. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention as well how we can break down barriers because we have formed LGBT against Islamophobia. It's really because Muslims are at the cutting edge of racism in the country um, and, it, and it's socialists that really do this because you look at elsewhere on the left you know they really struggle with that they end up in a mess don't they liberals end up in a situation where they end up um, condemning people and, 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 and perpetuating the division and really um, you know not, not just class but also the, 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 the fact that we have a party and an organisation that's capable of supporting each other and taking on those arguments is really really important I'd enjoy, encourage you to join the SWP and I think you know the, 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 the uh, title campaign is a really good example of that last night people rallied around to think about all the connections that we have across the class um, to, to be able to, to help each other and that's what you'll get if you're in the SWP the ability to be able if you want to fight then we're with you and we'll look at ways of, of collectivizing that and generalizing in that um, to make a difference I want to end on 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 this really though because the socialist uh, socialists have always been at the heart of the struggle against oppression and it predates Stonewall I started with Stonewall because that's really um, the, the, the birth of the modern LGBT movement but you know contrast Germany and Russia before um, you know all the awful things happened in Germany you know there was a really strong reformist current in Germany there's a really progressive state there's something like 40 gay bars um, there were you know committees of, of homosexuals for reform and things like that so really quite advanced and yet those arguments weren't capable of 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 taking on um, what was to be the most uh, awful event in, in the 20th century, the Holocaust. Um, in the Russian Revolution, though, you know, these, these organisations hadn't existed. I mean, it'd be great if they did, but my point is, is in the process of revolution and struggle, people were able um, to, to liberate themselves through a re the revolutionary process, and that's what we're really about. We want to liberate the whole of humanity, and we have to smash capitalism if we want a better society. And I I'll end with a quote from Engels. I think it's quite poetic. The language is a little bit dated, but you get the point really about how all of these boxes and categories and nasty ways in which every, everyone is, is sectioned off from each other could be lifted and taken away. What can we conjecture about the way in which sexual relations will be ordered after the impending overthrow of capitalist production is mainly of a negative character, limited for the most part of what will disappear? But what will there be new? That will be answered by a new generation that's grown up, a generation of men who've never in their lives ever known what it is to buy a woman's surrender with money or any other instrument of power, a generation of women who've never known what it is to give themselves to a man from any considerations other than real love or to refuse to give them themselves their lover for fear of economic consequences. When these people are in the world, they'll care precious little what anybody today thinks they ought to do. They'll make their own practice, their own corresponding public opinion about the, the practice of the individual and that will be the end of it. Mm -hmm.